everyone. Uh, for those who don't know me, I'm Meng Lu. I'm one of the current glaucoma fellows at the Moran. And um, I have the pleasure of giving the last grand rounds of this academic year. Um, I was initially pretty excited that I got assigned such a late date because I love to procrastinate. But as the date approached and I was struggling to find a topic, I realized all the topics that were of interest had already been talked about. Um, so this was sort of in the back of my head um, and I was doing clinic and this patient asked me a question that I think we get uh, actually quite often. And the patient who was very compliant with her eye drops wanted to know if there was anything else she could do to help control her uh, glaucoma. And so um, I sifted through a lot of patient testimonials and anecdotal evidence and I came up with there were four things um, that as physicians that we should be aware of um, when looking at a glaucoma patient and this is looking past drops, lasers, and surgery. And I'll go through each one of these. So the first is acupuncture or acupressure. Um, according to traditional Chinese medicine, there are two opposing forces known as yin and yang and the imbalance of these two forces cause a blockage of the vital energy also known as qi. So qi flows along pathways in the body known as meridians and they pass through certain points which can be stimulated known as acupoints. And it is believed that disease can be prevented or treated by stimulation of uh, relevant um, acupressure points. The mechanism of action of acupressure is not really known. We do know it has something to do with stimulation of the autonomic nervous system. More specifically to intraocular pressure in a rabbit model Chu and Potter found that uh, acupressure in certain points can reduce aqueous humor production, and there has been other studies showing increasing chorioretinal circulation. So um, Chinese medicine believes that weakness in the eye or eye disease is due to weakness in the liver or kidney, and so if you have eye issues, the liver and kidney acupoints would be stimulated and those are shown here in the supine and prone poses. There's also something known as auricular acupressure. There's a homunculus in your ear and stimulation of the corresponding point um, on the ear can help balance the corresponding organ. And so as you can see, the um, acupoint for the eye is down here on the ear lobe. So the literature does have um, a few reports of patients with glaucoma or ocular hypertension that shown a decrease in intraocular pressure after um, acupressure treatment um, and also one showing a lower variation in diurnal IOP 24 hours after treatment. The Cochrane Group attempted to do a review um, in 2007 to help establish acupuncture as a therapeutic modality for glaucoma. However, they found the studies that um, were available were of poor quality, um, no randomized control trials, and they were not able to establish um, the effect of acupuncture. This is a study that was published in 2010. It's a prospective randomized controlled trial done by a group in Taiwan. They studied the effect of ocular acupun uh, acupressure um, on patients that had been diagnosed with glaucoma or ocular hypertension for at least a year um, who had not undergone any laser trabeculoplasty or um, glaucoma surgery. They split these, two, these patients up into two groups, the control group and uh, the treatment group. In the treatment group, the patients received stimulation of the acupoints for the eye, liver, and kidney um, for three minutes twice a day for four weeks whereas the control group received um, acupoint tapping for, um, they assumed, unrelated um, acupoints for the jaw, wrist, and shoulder. They did actually find a uh, significant decrease in IOP in the control group versus the sham group um, as soon as 10 minutes after treatment and lasting all the way till four weeks. After four weeks, acupoint treatment was stopped and so at the eight week follow up, uh, there was no difference between uh, the two groups in their intraocular pressure. They also did show um, a decrease in IOP in the control group. Um, they did not mention whether this decrease in intraocular pressure, whether that was uh, statistically significant to baseline, 
but their theory as to this was because all the meridians are connected um, and so stimulation of the wrist or the shoulder could have had an effect downstream on the eye acupoint. Okay, now let's talk about exercise and glaucoma. Um, dynamic exercise such as walking, running, cycling, it's widely accepted in literature to have a decreased effect in intraocular pressure. Um, the three main theories as to why this occurs is either decrease in blood pH, perhaps due to elevated blood lactate, or elevated plasma osmolarity. This is a very busy table. Uh, it was compiled by Risner et al. in 2009. It just shows all the studies um, that show that dynamic exercise have um, an effect on IOP. I did highlight a couple of studies here. Um, all the arrows for IOP effect are pointing down except for Viera, which has the blue arrow. And um, their exercise, rather than biking, jogging, walking, was actually bench presses. And so the authors um, explain that their increase in IOP was likely due to the Valsalva maneuver uh, during the bench press. Um, Qureshi is circled here, something I want to talk about in a couple of slides. So yes, um, exercise does have a decreasing effect on IOP, but what about um, intensity of exercise? Do you get the same reduction in IOP um, n wh whether you're walking versus doing a more intense exercise? And that's what Qureshi studied. Uh, he looked at seven POAC patients versus seven healthy, normal subjects, all between the years of 40 and 50 years old. Um, all the subjects were put to three different levels of intensity of exercise, walking for an hour, jogging for an hour, or running as fast as possible until quote unquote volitional exhaustion, which is the exact quote from their paper. IOP was measured at baseline at 5, 20, 40, and 60 minutes. Um, and also after cessation of exercise every 10 minutes until IOP returned to baseline. So yes, like the other studies, they found that there was a decrease in IOP with exercise, but interestingly, they found that the more uh, strenuous or higher intensity of exercise, like running, the greater decrease in IOP. So that's the ovals versus the rectangles. Um, and furthermore, they found that running had a longer period of IOP decrease after cessation exercise than a lower intensity um, exercise such as walking. Okay, um, I want to talk about yoga because that's actually becoming very popular in America. This is the Shirshasana pose and its uh, modifications. Um, the Yoga Journal published a survey in 2012 that uh, reported 8.7% of U.S. adults uh, practice yoga. That is a 30% increase since 2008. Uh, and of current non-practitioners, uh, um, almost half of Americans call them aspirational yogis, meaning that they want to get into yoga, uh, forecasting a likely uh, increase in uh, yoga practice uh, in the near future. So it's very likely that many of our patients uh, participate in yoga, which is why I want to talk about this study that was published in Ophthalmology in 2006, um, discussing the pose that I had just shown, the Shoshasana, or headstand posture, uh, and its effect on intraocular pressure. So they recruited 75 uh, yoga practitioners and measured their IOP sitting at rest and also well in the head pose. And they found a two-fold increase in intraocular pressure while the patient was in the headstand posture. And that was maintained throughout uh, the time the patient was maintaining the posture but um, luckily came down back to baseline after resuming a normal sitting position. Um, they theorized the increase in IOP was likely due to increase in epistolar venous pressure while the patients are in that uh, stance. They did not find an increase in incidence of ocular hypertension or glaucoma in this cohort of yoga practitioners, though the average age was in the 30s, and that would be rather young for glaucoma. But um, they did advise that glaucoma patients be cautioned against uh, long times in the Shrasasana pose. Okay, um, occupation. This is not really a treatment, but it's something that we should be asking our patients, especially those 
who look like normal glaucoma, normal potential glaucoma patients, um, well controlled IOP in the office, but still with visual field progression. Um, there were a few case reports uh, about brass uh, instrument players who had exactly that, and that um, sort of uh, ended up in the study like this uh, by Schumann et al., a group from Tufts. Um, they looked at the effect of intraocular pressure, uh, excuse me, the high in resistance wind instrument on intraocular pressure. So they recruited 46 uh, professional musicians from the Boston area and split them into three groups high resistance wind instrument players, which you know is your oboe, bassoon, French horn, trumpet. The low resistance group um, included flute, clarinet, saxophone, <coughs> tuba, and trombone, and then the no resistance, which are the non-wind instrument players. And they performed baseline exams on all of these patients, including intraocular pressure, um, hungry visual field. And they found that there's no significant difference in the optic nerve head appearance among the three groups of musicians though no OCT RNFL was performed. But they did find that three out of the nine high resistance wind instrument players had abnormal visual fields, though they did not mention or describe the type of defect. This is uh, opposed to one out of 11 for low resistance and two out of 23 for the non-wind players who had abnormal visual fields. And the abnormal visual field was directly correlated to the number of life hours the musician had spent playing that high resistance uh, wind instrument player, one wind instrument. Um, they also, this looks fun, doesn't it? Um, this al they also measured um, IOP while the uh, musicians were playing their instruments. And this is a pneumatonometry tracing of IOP while an oboist was playing. Uh, you can see when uh, he or she started playing baseline IOP, maybe about 15, once uh, the musician started playing, it went up it, uh, five points to about 20, and then when the musician was asked to increase volume and pitch, um, the uh, IOP went up to as far high as 40. This is a slide showing a single mus musician playing three different instruments. So on the left, tracing A and B, um, are the, is the musician playing the clarinet and saxophone respectively, which are low resistance um, instruments. Um, baseline IOP, about 10, and as um, he starts playing, he's asked to increase the pitch to as high as possible and the volume to as high as possible. And um, the IOP peaks at just above 20. On the right is the trumpet, which is a high resistance instrument. So baseline IOP, that's where the red line is, about 10, and he peaks to uh, just above 30 when asked to play a high pitch at a high volume. Um, so they theorized that the Valsalma maneuver is uh, the reason why uh, for these increased intraocular pressure, it's uh, needed to play these high resistance uh, wind instruments. Um, it causes a rise in intrahepatic pressure, which compresses the vena cava. Uh, impeding the drainage of the vortex veins, increasing the episcleral venous pressure, and also increasing the uvea volume. So they concluded that high resistance wind instrument playing can cause transient increases in intraocular pressure. And in for those patients who seem like normal potential glaucoma patients, this is something that is important for us to rule out. Okay, and I want to end on a hot topic. Um, the state of marijuana, uh, this is published in Los Angeles earlier this year. Um, I'll soon be moving to the state of Washington, which has legalized medical and recreational marijuana. And I thought I should bone up on the facts about cannabis and glaucoma. Um, in the state of Utah, we are surrounded by uh, several states who does have legalized medical marijuana. Um, cannabis has more, more than 480 chemical constituents out of these, only 66 are cannabinoids, and those are compounds that contain only carbon, oxygen, and hydrogen. And the most infamous one is THC, or delta-9 tetrahydrocannabinoid. Um, it is responsible for the main psychotropic effect of marijuana. Um, its synthetic analogs, dronabinol or marinol, is actually currently used um, as appetite stimulation for AIDS patients and also treatment for nausea and vomiting in patients with chemotherapy. 
Um, so the effect of cannabis on uh, IOP has been well established since the early 1970s. Um, Helper and Frank noted a 25 to 30% reduction in IOP after patients smoked marijuana. Um, IV administration of THC in rabbits produced significant but short-term reductions in IOP. Um, and in 1984, Colasanti uh, from a topical application of cannabinoids in cats showed a localized effect. Interestingly, in the mid-1980s, California did fund a uh, cannabis therapeutic research program um, to study uh, the viability of THC or cannabis as long-term treatment for glaucoma. They enrolled nine patients, all with very severe uncontrolled end-stage POAG who were on maximum medical therapy. They started the patient either on 2.5 or 5 milligrams of POTHC QID and adjusted the dose uh, up or down depending on the effects and or side effects the patients experienced. So all the subjects uh, experienced an initial decrease in intraocular pressure. Um, five out of the nine later, however, showed some resistance um, because their IOP went up later in the treatment, and four out of the nine patients had to self-terminate um, the study due to intolerable side effects such as distortion perception, um, severe dizziness, and confusion. Um, interestingly, according to study protocol, all the patients, all four of these patients who were terminated were offered marijuana cigarettes to be smoked QID um, as a alternative to THC pills, and they all declined. So the mechanism of action of cannabis and IOP is still under investigation. Uh, we do know that the body produces endocannabinoids and they act on two different types of receptors, CB1 and CB2. We think it is the CB1 receptors that is responsible for the reduction in IOP because it has been localized in the human eye, in the ciliary bodies, um, trabecular meshwork in Schwab's canal. So what is the issue with cannabis um, and THC for glaucoma? Why is it currently not a really viable solution? Well, number one is duration of action is extremely short, only about three to four hours. And also, uh, most importantly, is the systemic and psychotropic effects. So coupled together, uh, a patient would have to be essentially high 24-7 to have a nice reduction <coughs> in IOP. And that's why there's been a lot of interest in topical cannabinoids because that would reduce the amount of systemic side effects while localizing uh, its IOP reducing effect. The issue with this is that natural and synthetic forms of cannabinoids are extremely lipophilic, so they have poor corneal penetration and also low aqueous solubility. Uh, Merritt's group in 1981 instilled uh, eye drop form of THC in glaucoma patients they did find a significant reduction in IOP with minimal systemic effects. However, they had to mix the THC with mineral oil as a vehicle, which was extremely irritant to the human eye. Um, and Roth and Green in uh, 1982 attempted using topical THC on rabbits uh, without mixing it with an agent. It was found that there was no effect on IOP, uh, but did cause a lot of eye irritation. So what is in the future? There's currently a uh, synthetic non-psychoactive cannabinoid known as dexanabinol or HG211. Um, in rabbit studies, it's shown to decrease IOP for as long as six hours with no change in blood pressure, heart rate, or pupil dilation. Um, I couldn't find any uh, reports of this uh, drug in patients for glaucoma, although I do know that it is currently under um, investigation for treatment for um, I think traumatic brain injury and also uh, solid tumors. But until something more concrete comes out, um, this is the AGS stance, official stance on tumor glaucoma that was published, published in 2010, uh, written by Henry Jim Pell. Um, he says that the, although marijuana can lower the IOP, its side effects and short duration of action, coupled with the lack of evidence that its use alters the course of glaucoma, preclude recommending this drug in any form for the treatment of glaucoma at the present time. So when a patient asks you if there's anything else he or she can do besides sticking with a drug regimen and coming to his or her follow-ups, um, it's a good time to take the opportunity to educate a patient about his or her disease. 
and um, there are a few activities that should be avoided by the glaucoma patient, prolonged head down position, Valsalma man maneuvers, asking if he or she is a professional trumpet player. Um, aerobic exercise has been shown to have um, some benefit and should be used um, intensity depending on the general health of the patient. And we should emphasize that alternative therapy of, uh, cannot substitute the conventional treatment available currently. All right, thank you. Thank you. 